All right, we're going to have a little more fun with op amps today. Uh, I did a video a while back on just the basics of op amps and how to understand how most op amp circuits work. And I'll put a link to that video down below. And also fairly recently, Dave Jones did a really nice video on the same topic, uh, just uh, the basics of op amp circuits. So if you haven't viewed that first, either mine or Dave's or both, I'd recommend going off and taking a look at that. Uh, today we're going to take a, a look at a very popular configuration called the summing amplifier uh, based with an op amp. Now there are two configurations. There's an inverting configuration which we'll consider first and there's also a non-inverting configuration. And uh, the inverting cons configuration has some advantages so we'll deal with that one first and take a look at uh, how that works. We'll go through some of the quick theory and then make some measurements on the bench. Now calculating the response of a summing amplifier is really a simple lesson in superposition. Uh, and the basic property of superposition is that if you have a linear circuit, you can compu compute the response of the circuit to individual inputs one at a time and then add them together. The only caveat is, is that the inputs that you're not considering, the voltage sources you short to ground or short, and the current sources you open. So in our case, uh, We'll just uh, consider each of these as voltage sources of V1 and V2 as the inputs. So to compute the response uh, of the output, we simply consider the response of each of these individually. So if we say V2 is shorted or zero, um, and that effectively puts this point at ground, this point's at virtual ground because of the negative feedback, so that uh, component doesn't enter into it at all. So we compute the response due to V1 is simply you know, minus V1 times RF over R1. And similarly, when we want to compute the response due to V2, uh, we would short or you know, short out V1. That takes that out of the equation because there's no voltage across that resistor. It's not contributing any current. So then that is minus V2 times RF over R2. And we basically take those two results and add them together and get V out. And as you can see, if we add more stages here, the, you know, the, we would just keep adding those terms. So one of the nice things about uh, the inverted configuration is that each input sees a fixed load to virtual ground because remember the op amp, you know, by its nature of its negative feedback is going to force this point to be equal to this point which in this case I've got ground so that's effectively a virtual ground. So regardless of what's going on with these voltage inputs here, um, the they're always seeing their own input resistor to ground, a virtual ground. So that's a nice feature. That also means that generally there's no interaction from one input to another. Regardless of what we do at uh, one of these other inputs, uh, we're not going to see any effect of that on the other inputs. And it's also really easy to calculate the response to diff additional inputs because we're just adding terms to this equation. So let's go see how this all works on the bench. Okay, so this is the circuit I've got on the bench. I've got the feedback resistor here set to 20K, and then two input resistors, 5K and 10K. V1 is set to a half a volt, 500 millivolts, and V2 is set to one volt. So if we take a look at that here on the bench, uh, yeah, this is the circuit board here, uh, and I've got V1 and V2 coming in via these two uh, clips here into the inputs. Now let's go make some measurements. So if we take just the voltmeter to start off with and take a look at the you know, input 1 with respect to ground. We can see that's so 0.499 or half a volt, 0.5 volts. Input number 2 is uh, just about 1 volt. Uh, it's only about you know, 5 millivolts off. So uh, if we take a look at the output. You can see the output is uh, just about minus 4, minus 3.97 volts. And that all should work out in the math, right? We take a look at our equations here again. If I've got, uh, considering th this contribution of V1, I would have you know a half a volt times RF divided by R1. So RF divided by R1 is 4 times a half a volt. That would be minus 2 volts. And in this case, V2 is 1 volt. RF over R2, 20K over 10K, that's also 2. So this would be minus 2 volts. So I have minus 2 minus another 2 V out would be minus 4 volts, and that's exactly what we measured. You see the same thing on the oscilloscope. 
Uh, channel 1 is the yellow trace, that's uh, 0.5 volts. Yeah, I'm at uh, 500 millivolts of division, uh, half a division up from the middle where I've got ground set. That's V1, that's V2, and V out is down here at uh, minus 4 volts. Channel 3, which is showing that, is set to 2 volts a division. The other two inputs are set to 500 millivolts a division. So I can see that uh, DC case. Now, of course, this same relationship holds if we apply signals to channel 1 and channel 2. So if I take channel 1 and I turn it into a sine wave and I take channel 2 and I turn it into a square wave uh, now the voltages just, just add up as you might expect and we can actually see that on the scope. Let's uh, zoom in on the scope screen here and I can see channel 1 is my sine wave channel 2 is the square wave and uh, they're going to add in an inverse fashion and there's some gain applied but we can literally see that these are just the sum of those two voltages. So that's the real nice thing about a summing amplifier is we can keep adding inputs in and add DC offsets or add uh, you know, other signals to each other and combine them into a single output. So now let's consider the non-inverting configuration. It's not quite as uh, easy and simple as the inverting configuration, but it's really not that hard either. So we've just got this amplifier set up as a non-inverting non amplifier, and if we think about uh, just a single-ended stage uh, without uh, considering multiple inputs, the basic gain of a non-inverting amplifier is whatever voltage is appearing at the non-inverting input multiplied by RF over RN uh, plus 1. So that's the only real difference. And of course it's not inverting, so it's not inverting. So even if these two resistors are the same, like I have on the breadboard is 10K, we're going to have a basic gain from the input node here of 2. So now again we can apply superposition and consider the contribution from each input individually. And remember for the input that we're not considering, we short it out. Alright, so in this case we're going to short it out to ground Okay, for our computation. So we're going to basically compute what voltage is appearing at this non-inverting input for each of these individually. So uh, the output voltage then is going to be equal to our basic gain term, RF over RN plus 1, times the contribution from V1, which is the simple voltage divider formed by, you know, if this, this point is connected to ground, I've got a voltage divider dividing V1 down to some smaller value here, okay, because of these two resistors. So it's V1 times R2 over the sum of R1 plus R2. That's the contrib contribution due to V1. So next if we short V1 and we can tr consider the comp uh, contribution from V2, that's V2 times R1 divided by the sum of R1 and R2. We add those two contributions up, we multiply by the gain term, and we get V out. Just as we had in the earlier case, V1 is set to uh, 0 0.5 volts, V2 is set to 1 volt. So let's compute uh, these various terms. Now in this case, this term right here is very easy. RF over RN is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, so this quantity equals 2. So we just need to compute these two quantities here and here. So this one here is V1 times R2 over the sum. So V1 is 0.5 times R2 is 10K divided by 15K. So we just take uh, 0.5 times 10K divided by 15K and we're left with 0.33333 or a third of a volt. Okay, so let's point, uh, put 0.333 there. Let's compute this term here. V2 again is 1 volt, but this time we multiply against R1, which is uh, 5K. So I have 1 times 5 divided by that same 15k and I'm left with another 0.333 those two added up okay is 0.66666 multiply by 2 that was our gain term and we should have a volt, uh, uh, an output voltage of 1.333 so let's go take a look at the hardware and see what we have alright let's go make those measurements again again uh, input uh, number one is a half a volt, that's the one that's going through the 5k resistor. Input two is one volt, that's the one that's going through the 10k resistor. And our output right over here 
that's 1.34 volts, 1.343, that's only 10 millivolts off. That's close enough considering these resistors are all like 5% resistors and things like that. So, uh, so we see that the DC analysis works there as well. And of course, just like the inverting case, if these inputs are not DC but some other voltages, they'll add the same way. But in this case, they're going to add without doing any inversion. So again, let's take channel 1 and turn it into that sine wave. Take channel 2 and turn it into that square wave. And now if we take a look at the scope screen here, we can see that these inputs have added in, you know, in a non-inverting non way uh, and created the output. So there's my channel 1 sine wave, there's my channel 2 uh, square wave, and there's the summed result. Everything is kind of adding you know, in phase, not inverted. And of course, uh, I've got a different voltage scale here. This is on 2 volts uh, per division, so that's why this uh, signal is looking smaller. But you can see that they're adding in phase and not inverting. So, uh, so what we've seen is that, um, that you can have two configurations of these uh, summing amplifiers, both inverting and non-inverting. And uh, we've found that the inverting is pretty easy to calculate out. Uh, what we've learned though is that with the non-inverting there's a couple of other interesting characteristics. Uh, we've seen that the uh, load on each of the inputs is going to depend on what the other inputs are doing. Because what I mean by that, if we uh, take a look at this, as we change voltages here and here, uh, basically it's the net effect of all the inputs that's going to determine what the input voltage is here. So as the other input voltages change, this node is going to change. So as far as the other you know, inputs are concerned, the, they're looking into you know, a load resistor that's going to a voltage that is going to depend on all the other inputs. So there is a potential for having some interaction between the inputs on the, uh, in this non-inverting case. But of course that's going to depend really on the source impedance of the input voltages that are being applied there. And it could also see it's a little more complicated to calculate the response to each of these things. So oftentimes uh, what might be interesting is and, and easier to do is to uh, build your summing circuit as an inverting circuit and then just follow that with another inverting amplifier with say a gain of one. And uh, by doing that uh, you get all the advantages of the, not, of the inverting case where you don't have any interaction between the two and all the inputs see a constant load. Uh, so you get all those nice things and it makes it all easy to compute and then you simply do an inversion of the output uh, you know, with one more stage. So sometimes that's easier to do. And now of course you can also you know, combine these stages, apply you know, say more inputs you know, on the inverting side, more inputs on the uh, non-inverting side and do it all in one stage and that's very common to do as well. You'll often see op-amp circuits that, that their whole job is to add a DC offset to a signal or maybe adjust the offset of a signal. Uh, that's all typically just variations on this theme of a summing amplifier. So anyway, I hope you found this video useful. And uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, please send them along. I'd always be happy to hear from you. Thank you.